Yeah, let's start the last two talks um, at the BIR workshop. I'm very happy that Lucy Lu Wang is joining us. She's coming from Seattle, um, early morning for her. So good morning. <laughs> um, Lucy is a postdoctoral investigator at the LNII um, in the Semantic Scholar Research Group. Um, she works on biomedical ontologies, text mining, NLP, and um, yeah, is the first author and I think the leading um, scientist um, around the CORD-19 data set, uh, which was um, generated and published in March last year. And it's an incredible rich resource. Um, I used it for teaching purposes this semester, and I really appreciate this effort and the, the wonderful data set. Hundreds of people used it, or thousands of people used it. Um, you will tell us a little bit more about this. I'm very happy that we have you here. Um, we have roughly um, 30 minutes presentation time, and then I would um, open the Q&A and, yeah and then discuss. Lucy, right, that, very happy yeah. to have you here and uh, please start. All right, thank you so much, Philip. That was, uh, uh, thanks for that introduction. Uh, and of course, thanks to the other organizers for having me, I'm very excited to be here. Um, my name's Lucy Lu Wang. Uh, I'm currently at the Allen Institute for AI where I'm a member of the Semantic Scholar Research Team and today, um, I guess I will spend this time talking to everyone about uh, text mining related insights from the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll definitely cover the CORD-19 data sets. Um, I'll cover some of the other resources that we've released in response to COVID-19, um, as well as uh, this kind of new and emerging retrieval and NLP task associated with scientific fact checking. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so everyone who's here is probably well aware of the issues of information overload and having too many papers to read. But let me start with a few numbers to really drill in this notion. So in a report by the United States National Science Foundation, it was found that there were over 2.6 million science and engineering papers published in 2018. Um, and this number, of course, continues to grow year upon year. And more than a million of these papers per year are uh, being published in the domain of biomedicine. So over a third of the papers. And finally, there are some reports that the median reading ceiling for researchers and scholars is around a very modest 250 papers per year, which means that even for those in smaller fields uh, that are publishing thousands of papers per year, um, it can be hard to keep up with all the new publications. And last year with COVID-19, we really saw this problem in action. So in 2020, starting in March, the number of COVID-19 research publications started ticking up and continues to, uh, to grow um, and uh, be published at a very high rate. So over 100,000 papers were published by the end of 2020. And as some countries enter their third or fourth waves of COVID activity, I suspect we'll continue to see a steady stream of research output. So among the headlines discussing this phenomenon of too many papers, there are also headlines like these, which refer to the publishing of lower quality research, the so-called bad COVID-19 research. Um, and there's also been some notable high profile retractions that have uh, kind of interrupted um, uh, the, the flow of research. So as a physician or a researcher who's embroiled in all this, you might be thinking, oh my goodness, there's so many papers, which one should I pay attention to? Which one should I read? Uh, or maybe you might have questions about quality. So there's this new paper, but it's maybe still only a preprint and the study was only conducted on a handful of individuals. So should I trust the findings? And finally, do the results in this paper even apply to my patient? So say uh, the study in front of you was conducted on a bunch of 65 year olds in Norway, but I have a 35 year old sitting in my office in Seattle, what's the right thing to do in their case? So all of this taken together really emphasizes the need for these automated and assistive systems to support various clinical and biomedical information seeking needs. So in today's talk, 
I'll discuss uh, some of the work that I've been involved in at AI2 to help address these challenges. Uh, some of this work lays the foundation for scientific IR and NLP, such as these corpus resources uh, of uh, STORC and CORD-19. And CORD-19, as some of you know, has been used as the foundation of various information retrieval and question answering shared tasks, which I will also briefly discuss. Uh, the CORD-19 dataset was built upon this more general purpose corpus resource called STORC, uh, which I will uh, briefly introduce first. And then in the last part of my talk, I'll discuss uh, uh, SciFact, which introduces this task of scientific fact checking. Um, it's a more tailored application that supports a very specific uh, biomedical information seeking need. And then uh, for this project, we collect and release a data set to support modeling the relationships between scientific claims and evidence, uh, and then also demonstrate how it might work in practice uh, for COVID-19, where we saw this significant dissemination of misinformation and lower quality information. So let me start by introducing these two corpus resources. Uh, STORC stands for the Semantic Scholar Open Research Corpus. This is a corpus of machine readable full text papers created to support uh, scientific IR, NLP, and text mining. CORD-19 stands for the COVID-19 Open Research Dataset. Uh, this is kind of a case study of SORC in action where we specifically release a data set focused on COVID-19 related research papers. So our main motivation for creating these resources is this need for better corpus resources to support scientific NLP. There's a lot of previous corpora, but they tend to be on the smaller side or are specific to a certain domain. And there's also certain attributes of these corpora that make them not ideal for NLP. For example, uh, if they're small, it can be hard to train large language models on their content. And contemporary contextual language models are generally pre-trained on large amounts of text in the many uh, billions of tokens. And a larger pre-training corpus is generally considered to be better. Um, several of these resources lack paper structure. Uh, for example, things like paragraph breaks and section headings. And these structure capture uh, a lot of significant information about a paper's organization and content. So having them around is very valuable for modeling and understanding the content of these papers. Some of these other corpora have text snippets rather than full text of these documents. And that's an obvious deficiency for tasks like retrieval or question answering, where it's useful to have that full text. And finally, some of them have poor support for span annotations because they are provided in a format like XML where many tags are mixed in with a text and there's actually no clearly defined schema for how each tag is to be used. So we wanna make papers more machine readable. Uh, but why is this challenging? The main challenge is that the vast majority of scientific papers are distributed in PDF format. And of course, PDF has many great uses, but it conflates layout information or visual information with the semantic content of these documents. So here's just a snippet of a page in PDF. In order to make this PDF machine readable, a system needs to be able to, to look at it and recognize that the upper left hand corner is a figure, the upper right hand is a uh, table and, and so on. And then also represent the information in a way um, that uh, can facilitate processing. So for Stork, we defined and created a process to convert these various paper formats that conflate layout and semantics and then rip out just the semantic components and represent this in a JSON format uh, with a uh, defined schema. And then we, we apply this process at a large scale over the full database of papers collected by the Semantic Scholar Academic Search Engine. And these papers were primarily available in PDF, which I mentioned, but many of them were also available with LaTeX source or in publisher provided XML formats. So we try to take advantage of all of these uh, document types when we have access to them. In short, this is how uh, STORC was created. So first we identify papers from different sources that are indexed in Semantic Scholar and we cluster similar papers together, uh, selecting um, uh, the one from which uh, to derive canonical metadata. We then, uh, of course, identify open access documents where we have access to the full text. We process these documents into JSON 
using a number of open source tools like Grub and Science Parse, uh, as well as uh, custom parsers that we wrote for this purpose um, for converting the outputs of these models into JSON and then uh, also from LaTeX and XML to JSON directly. Finally, we resolve the citation links between these documents uh, and we release the full text and citation information as part of the Stork corpus. So this corpus is larger and more diverse than previous corpora that have been released. It consists of approximately 12 million full text papers. Uh, these are open access full text papers and more than 400 million citation edges. And more importantly, about 156 million of these uh, citation edges are supported by context. What I mean by that is that you can go to the, the source text and find the specific sentences used by the authors to reference the articles in uh, uh, the, the other articles for which we also have full text. So in the table below, I'm just showing a comparison between Stork and other publicly available corpora. So as you can see, the size the full text representation and the representation of various academic disciplines um, in Stork are uh, notable and kind of set it apart. So to briefly summarize the contributions of Stork, we designed and introduced this JSON schema for representing paper metadata and full text. And you can find out more about that uh, in, in our paper. This JSON schema tries to preserve high level paper structure like paragraph breaks and section headings. Um, of course, pr preserves things like bibliography, figures, and tables, and it allows for uh, uh, span annotations over the full text of these papers. And we also release this large corpus of papers as a part of this project. And we'd like to think that releasing this corpus has made it somewhat easier for many groups to work with scientific papers and to develop NLP systems for scientific texts. And finally, we introduced a pipeline for performing this conversion from uh, various types of paper documents to JSON um, and release this uh, as a, a public tool. And I stress that there were many challenges to getting a functional pipeline. Um, PDFs are, of course, very difficult to parse. But uh, document types like XML and LaTeX, um, these are Turing complete languages. So again, there are infinite ways in which people uh, can and absolutely do represent the content of these documents. Uh, it's not an easy problem and many parts of it remain unsolved um, and the progress I show here is one step forward. And of course another contribution of Stork is that it allowed us to create the CORD19 data set very quickly uh, in, in response to the request early last year. So back in March 2020 I helped to lead this uh, collaborative effort which involved of course, Semantic Scholar at AI2, uh, and the many other organizations which I've listed here. Uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy approached us back in March to create this data set. And we originally had, I think, six days uh, for the initial release. And the goal of the data set was to encourage and support the computing and machine learning communities to join the fight against COVID-19. So what exactly is in CORD19? Um, well, we started with a number of sources of papers, databases like the World Health Organization's COVID database, PubMed Central, PubMed, and these various preprint servers. And we uh, ingested and processed papers from these sources. And then we, um, uh, we normalized all the metadata into one format, parse the full text, and release these as part of CORD19. And of course, this full text representation and processing pipeline reuses parts of the Stork JSON representation and pipeline that I previously discussed. So here's an example of what an entry in CORD19 looks like. The metadata for the paper will have fields like a unique identifier, uh, titles, authors, publication venues, and dates, um, uh, typical kind of paper metadata fields, uh, as well as information about source and licensing. And then when full text is available, we process those documents into JSON using the Stork pipeline. Um, resulting in you know, snippets of JSON like this, and we link these uh, full text JSON to the metadata entry. So the data set has been a really pivotal part of several completed and ongoing shared tasks, which I've shown on the right here. Uh, these shared tasks are community efforts that were put together to help evaluate the effectiveness of models and systems for retrieving relevant documents or for extracting useful results out of these papers. 
Um, I've been a co-organizer in several of these tasks that I've shown here, and I'll briefly uh, discuss them. And again, the goal of these shared tasks is to try to empower the community to create systems that can answer questions about COVID-19. For example, uh, maybe given a clinically relevant query like this one, does hypertension increase the risks associated with COVID-19? Uh, the goal might be to create a system that can uh, retrieve the relevant papers out of this set of papers in CORD-19 uh, or any other corpus, and then extract uh, evidence spans that perhaps answer this query. So let me just uh, summarize some of the brief takeaways for, for the uh, shared tasks. So for the Kaggle CORD-19 research challenge, uh, per participants were given information seeking questions and they were asked to create systems that would effectively answer these questions. Um, for example, an input question might be, what are the primary risk factors for COVID-19? So one paradigm kind of stood out as being an effective way of communicating the results of these systems to medical users. So given a particular question like this one, a group of medical experts first got together and they defined a set of attributes that were relevant for answering this question. So for example, um, for this question, the answer might need to include things like uh, the type of risk factor or the severity of the risk or the type of study that was conducted uh, or the sample size. So after formulating these attributes, participants could then engineer systems that effectively completed this table by extracting various corresponding spans from different papers in the, uh, in the corpus um, that matched against these attributes. So the organizers of the Kaggle share task were able to define this new task by fostering communication between the participants of the challenge and the medical experts who were judging the success of the systems. Uh, and of course, the medical experts were also the ones who were ultimately consuming the results of these systems and could help guide their creation. And another early shared task for COVID-19 was the Trek COVID ad hoc retrieval challenge. This is an information retrieval task, also using CORE-19, and it's explicitly trying to assess the performance of uh, retrieval systems. There were a set of questions that were defined by organizers shown on, on the left here. Um, some exa examples are shown on the left here. Um, and these are naturally occurring questions that were derived from Medline, medical forums, and social media. And participants would submit ranked retrieval results, which are then assessed by expert annotators for relevance. The most interesting and novel part of the Trek COVID challenge is its five round design. So we ran five rounds of this challenge over the months of April to July, 2020 with different versions of CORE-19. Uh, so you can see this on, in that diagram on the right. Um, and the increasing size of the corpus between each round meant that systems needed to be able to adapt to new information as it emerged. Um, so the corpus increased in size from about 51,000 articles in April to about 191 articles in June, so almost a quadrupling. And another unique component of this challenge is that the types of questions people asked changed as the COVID situation evolved. So in round one, we were seeing very general questions around the origin, transmission, and mortality rates of COVID-19. By round three, there were new concerns that were arising about uh, mutations in the virus, uh, about longer term complications for those who've already gotten it. Uh, and then finally in round five, we introduced question or there were questions that were um, about vaccination, uh, about reopening policy and so on. So not only did the systems have to adopt to a changing corpus, uh, they also had to adapt to changing topics in the questions and the shifting nature of relevance over time. And what I mean by that is that the very beginning of the pandemic, we didn't really know anything. So a document that was even marginally relevant would be classified by annotators as being relevant. Um, but as we learned more, uh, time went on, those marginally relevant documents maybe they lost uh, relevance. So I think this is an interesting aspect of real world retrieval, which we were able to somewhat capture in this uh, laboratory setting for the track COVID challenge. And Jimmy Lin, who's giving the next keynote will surely have a lot to add about this share task and some of the others that I'm talking about. His group submitted some of the top performing systems uh, and I'm 
pretty excited to hear his take. And what we learned from this experience overall with CORD19 is that having shared data sets and resources can really help to speed up system building. So where previously an individual or a group working uh, on one of these uh, systems would have to need to perform all of these steps from formulating a task to constructing a data set to developing models and then finally evaluating the performance of these models. Well, in this case, we were able to speed up system building by introducing a, uh, the Core 19 public corpus. And of course, these various shared tasks and competitions for judging and comparing the performance of these systems. And, and this down here, um, I think is like, a, it's, it's a kind of a great format to use in the future. And of course, uh, we weren't the first to run shared tasks uh, or competitions. These uh, techniques have been used before. Um, but in this case, one of the uh, unique things we saw is that the shared tasks were very open-ended. Um, for example, the Kaggle challenge, and it led to the creation and formulation of new tasks. So in summary, the CORE19 uh, case study was a pretty successful um, test. So in the 12 months since we were first released CORE19, um, um, yeah, so since, uh, since March of 2020, the data set's been downloaded more than 150,000 times various versions of it. There are hundreds of groups that are have been active in these shared tasks. So over 500 teams in the Kaggle challenge uh, and over 55 teams participating in Trek COVID. And there've also been over 50 live search and discovery systems and demos. Um, and many of these are still up and available to test. So now I'll turn my attention to uh, a related project called SciFact. Um, and the goal of this project was to introduce the task of scientific fact checking and to create a data set and models to help identify evidence for uh, scientific claims. And I, as I mentioned before, we tested these models on COVID-19 related claims um, that were created uh, from the Kaggle challenge questions. So the main reason for, for doing this is to try to reduce misinformation in science. So there's been rapid proliferation of misinformation in the news and on the web. Uh, and last year, of course, there were these reports of COVID-19 related public health misinformation. Um, there have been some fact checking systems that have been deployed in the news domain, but these systems uh, generally don't work for scientific claims for a few reasons. Uh, for example, scientific text tends to contain specialized language, so the models would need to be uh, domain adapted. Scientific claims also uh, can require background or expert knowledge, which is not represented in the general domain. And also uniquely, scientific claims, um, they're not factoid claims, so they, they're not always clearly true or false. Sometimes um, a claim can be an emerging finding for which there is limited evidence. Uh, so because of these reasons, we sort of need to redefine the fact-checking task so that it can be done in science. So let me introduce the task that we defined of scientific claim verification. First, you start with a claim. And a claim is just an atomic statement about a particular entity or process. Uh, and it also has to be verifiable. And what that means is it, it can't be a statement of opinion. Um, so then the fact checker will take the claim as input along with a corpus of documents and then verify the claim against the text in the documents. And it does this by identifying rationale sentences from among these, uh, the text of these documents where these rationales provide some evidence towards uh, the claim. Then finally, given these rationale sentences, the fact checker will determine whether the rationales support or refute the claim. And I'm showing an example in this diagram here. As I mentioned, there's some prior work for fact checking in the general domain. And the most relevant of these uh, are the FEVER data set, which is a, a large data set of factoid claims created from Wikipedia. These were written and verified by crowd workers. 
and the other is UKP Snopes, which is a political fact-checking data set. But what about claim verification in science? Well, first of all, when we started this project, there were no existing data sets in this domain, um, which made it sort of difficult to study. But there are some nice things about science and scientific text. One is that scientific papers are full of claims. And the other is that in many cases, the claims are about other papers. So the citation relationship tells us where to uh, look for the evidence. However, because of the challenges I talked about before, you really can't use crowdsource, or um, it's difficult uh, to use crowdsourcing to generate data in this space. So we, for, for this project, we limited our options to uh, expert annotations. And I, as I mentioned, these citation sentences are really great natural sources of scientific claims. So from scientific papers, we can extract citation sentences as claims. And then we can look at the cited articles for uh, a source of evidence. And of course, in, in this case, we derive these citation sentences directly from the stork corpus. And another great thing about the citation network is that it's actually, um, it naturally provides what we call distractor articles or hard negative examples. So these are papers that are in the same general area as the claim and have text uh, that uh, shares um, features with the claim, but they don't actually contain evidence. So these can be taken from the bibliography of, of the source paper. But there's two hidden tasks here uh, where we require expert annotations because neither the claim nor the evidence can be used directly in the form that I've shown on this slide. So we hire and train skilled annotators to help bridge these gaps. First, we ask the annotators to rewrite the citation sentences as, uh, as a claim. So here's an example. As you can see, the annotator performs significant uh, simplification of the citation sentence. And usually we ask them to only take one component of the sentence, making the claim atomic. Then another annotator will take this claim uh, and one of the cited articles in that citation sentence, and they'll identify the rationale for the claim in that cited article. For example, uh, the highlighted span here. There were many annotators involved in this project. Uh, we had four NLP researchers as well as 15 undergrads and five graduate students with biomedical background. And over the course of several months, these annotators uh, wrote about 1400 claims and verified these against uh, 5,000 articles. And I stress that this annotation process was not easy. There was a lot of training and iteration that was necessary be before we arrived at a reasonable agreement. And we did uh, throw away a lot of early annotations. We then implemented a baseline model for this task, which is called Verisci. To remind everyone of the task, the inputs are a claim sentence and a corpus of documents. Then the model outputs a set of rationale sentences extracted from those uh, documents, as well as the evidence labels associated with each rationale. Now, these labels can be either supports, refutes, or no information. The task performed by, by the model, um, uh, as, as we defined it, can be broken down into three subtasks, document retrieval, rationale selection, and label prediction. So document retrieval is where the model selects documents from the corpus that are likely to contain the rationale. And this is necessary because the corpus uh, is usually made up of many tens of thousands or even millions of documents. Then rationale selection is identifying the specific sentences from each document that provide information about the claim. And finally, for each selected rationale in relation to the claim, the model predicts the associated evidence label. And our, our baseline model, uh, we just implemented a uh, BERT-to-BERT architecture. Um, and we experimented with several different variants of BERT-like models like Roberta Large and Cybert. Uh, our initial retrieval baseline was just the TF-IDF, where we select the top five documents from the corpus by TF-IDF similarity to the claim. And for rationale selection and label prediction, we fine tune a separate BERT model for each step and then glue the inputs and outputs together. So how does the model perform? Here I'm comparing two versions. Zero shot means that it was trained on fever, uh, which is the general domain fact checking data set, and Verisci is trained on both fever and the data we collected. In the open setting, the model is responsible for all, all three of those subtasks, which I'm showing as a reminder in the top right corner. 
And I don't want to harp on this uh, here too much since uh, people have made improvements from this baseline. Um, but essentially, the performance was relatively low in the zero shot setting, but uh, Verisci, tr that's trained on the SciFact data set, performs better. Uh, and if the model gets retrieval for free, we see um, uh, when it's given the correct abstracts uh, and it only needs to do rationale selection and label prediction, performance improves by over 20 F uh, F1 points. And similarly, if it gets rationale selection for free, uh, performance also improves significantly. And of course, right after this talk, uh, in Jimmy Lin's talk, he will also talk more about um, uh, how his team has made significant advances on this task and data set. So, so now I want to spend a moment talking about practical performance. So the Kaggle Core 19 challenge occurred at around the same time last year as we were working on this system and uh, creating this data set. So it was a really good opportunity for us to test our system on a real world task, uh, this, this challenge of identifying evidence for COVID-19 claims. So we took the questions from that shared task and we asked several medical students to convert the answers of these questions into claims. So using the same instructions that we provided for annotation, we asked them to rewrite these into claims. Uh, then we ran the model uh, using the Core 19 data set as the corpus of documents against these claims, getting the rationale sentences and the labels, evidence labels. And then we asked the medical students again to judge and evaluate whether the results of the system were plausible. And here we define plausible as more than 50% of the retrieved evidence spans have a both, uh, both a correct rationale and label. And after doing this, we found that about two thirds of the uh, evidence were plausible. And this is just a screenshot of uh, the demo that we put up um, to show these claims. But let me show you an example of what the system returns. So given this claim, lopinavir and ritinavir have exhibited favorable clinical responses when used as a treatment for coronavirus. The system is able to report supporting statements like this one, which says that these drugs uh, reduce coronavirus viral loads significantly. Uh, but there, it, this, and the system is also able to re return refuting evidence. For example, this is another preprint that says that the same drugs have been reported failed for curing SARS-CoV-2. So, so here the system is exhibiting the right, uh, the behavior that we would expect. So what are the main takeaways for this project? So first, domain-specific data is necessary to make things work in the scientific domain. Training only on the general domain fact-checking data set um, even when they were significantly larger, didn't really lead to stellar results. Uh, current models are also reasonably performant in real world claim verification settings, as I just uh, showed for uh, COVID-19, although of course there's room for improvement. And of course, there's just overall uh, plenty of room for improvement. We can uh, certainly do better on retrieval. And in fact, other groups have um, Perhaps incorporating background knowledge could be useful. Uh, there are certain types of reasoning that are still hard for, uh, for these language models. For example, numeracy, when we ask the models to do math or dealing with long-tailed named entities. And finally, we currently don't assess the quality of evidence from the source documents. So there's usually multiple rationales and multiple labels. And in that example I showed in the last slide, there was also contradictory evidence for, uh, for certain claims from different papers. So in cases like that, how should the reader weigh the evidence? Is one of the papers more trustworthy than the other? And these are ongoing questions that I think are, would be very interesting to uh, investigate. So very, um, I'm uh, uh, just a few minutes from, from completion. So in summary, I've introduced some of the corpus resources that we released to make it easier to create these NLP systems in the scientific domain. And specifically, I described Stork and Core 19. And then I also talked about SciFact, which is um, uh, a data set to support scientific fact checking. And we were able to see that current systems may be able to help with some of the issues around misinformation in science, although there's still a long road to, uh, uh, to making those uh, productionized. So now building on top of this work, um, and especially in, for some of those ex examples I showed for SciFact, I really think there's a need in this space for more systems to help with uh, automating and assistive literature reviews. 
So in other words, once we have a lot of evidence about a particular claim or research question, can we aggregate and summarize this evidence in an actionable way? So very quickly, why automate literature reviews? So first of all, systematic literature reviews that are a unique type of publication that tries to summarize all available evidence on a research question. They've been adopted in various domains, but they're especially important for clinical medicine. And it's because in clinical medicine, they're accepted as providing the highest quality evidence for clinical care. However, they're very expensive and time consuming to produce. It can take several researchers between six months to two years to finish one of these reviews, which means that there aren't enough of them and they quickly go out of date. So automation is something that can really make a difference here. Here's uh, the several steps to creating a review, formulating a question, identifying relevant studies, assessing quality, extracting and summarizing evidence, and then interpreting the findings. And these middle steps are really where I think we can make a difference uh, to support researchers. For example, can we identify relevant studies uh, with high precision to reduce the amount of work that researchers need to do? Can we assess study quality uh, automatically? So there's some established grading scales for this, but there are no uh, great automated methods for, for performing uh, this task. And once we have quality, how should we prioritize different studies based on their quality? And then finally, for extracting and summarizing evidence, uh, once we have systems that are able to do this, sometimes the results can still be contradictory as I just showed. So in those cases, what's the best way to aggregate and present these findings to users? So I'll leave these questions as thought exercises for the audience and, uh, and I'll wrap up my talk. Um, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators on these various projects, especially those who are involved in CORD-19 and the various share tasks that we ran. Um, and of course, the many members of the Semantic Scholar team and other teams at the Allen Institute for AI. Uh, thank you all for being here and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions.